we are starting chapter 46 of the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe's Tanya. This is a beautiful, beautiful Kabbalistic text, which uh, goes through all kinds of uh, ways of understanding ourselves and mastering ourselves. So just to get us uh, up to speed with where we are in our class, uh, if you've been with us, this will be familiar. The first few chapters, we learned about the structure of our soul. And in fact, that we have two souls operating at the same time. We have the ego soul, which called the animal soul. And we have the other centered soul, which we call the divine soul. That's why there's a little struggle inside me. I know I want to act a certain way, speak a certain way. But for some reason, I can't just decide, okay, that's what I'm going to do and then do it. There's always this internal struggle where for some reason, even though I might decide I want to be this person, half an hour later, I'm being some other person. So then we learned uh, two techniques, uh, meditation techniques, in fact, on how to now master that duality. One was called the uh, long short path. And I won't go into details right now. The other is called the short long path. But essentially, we learned a technique to become what we call a Bainani, which is a person that may have struggled on the inside, but always is 100% in terms of their thought, their conscious thought, their speech, and their action. So that's the point, really, of this book, is to learn how to be a Bainani and use meditation to achieve that in life, in actual uh, interactions where I might be triggered or whatever. So what happens in my soul, my soul emotions that I've learned about, my intellect that I've learned about, that might be a struggle. But anytime I now consciously think about something or actually speak about it even more, or even more actually behave, act about it, now that's my responsibility and that I can have full mastery of at the level of the Bainani. Then we went, once we had the nuts and bolts of this technique, we learned a number of topics, for instance, uh, amping up joy because joy really makes everything easier to do as, as we've all experienced. Uh, of course, the opposite, dealing with depression, we learned about a powerful way to love every other person as I love myself and certainly every other Jew and a number of topics until we got to this current large section which started uh, at 41. So now I'll, I'll kind of walk through chapters 41 to 45 so we know where we're at. This section, now that we have two systems of meditation, an understanding of the soul, an understanding that there's two souls. Now I want to have content for my meditative technique. So these chapters are all about meditations that inspire different soul emotions. Because as I've said many times, meditating in Judaism is not to achieve transcendence. You may, you may have very, very spiritual experiences, but that's not the point, that's not the why. The why that we meditate is in order to elevate the mitzvahs that I do, in order to elevate the world around me. So maybe as simple as doing a blessing on some challah on a Friday night, and I'm elevating that actual piece of the earth, that bread, I'm elevating the energy that I get, I'm entered and elevating even my own uh, physical being that's involved in it. And to do that, I need what's called kavana, which is emotions. Kavana means having both love and awe that infuse the mitzvah that I do or the Torah that I'm learning right now. And those function as a soul for the mitzvah and elevate it to, I don't want to get into the Kabbalah right here, but to unite with, unite with the 10 spherot of whatever world we're working in. So now <clears throat> these chapters are giving us different meditative techniques to inspire different levels of love and different levels of awe. And you'll notice that in Judaism, love and awe are very distinct one from the other. The different types are very clearly defined. So in chapter 41, we reviewed the two major emotions, love and awe. And we said awe is, we'll call it foundational. Awe is the first, the first thing that needs to happen, and then you build everything else on top of it. Because uh, like I said, if I come home with flowers uh, for my wife, but I come home six hours late and dinner is cold and, and, and the kids are asleep and I didn't let her know, that love is not going to be received because there wasn't awe to begin with. I didn't have respect for her. So we start with a level of awe, of respect, and then we build love on top of that. Chapter 42, we looked at developing uh, just a basic level of awe. We call it yiratata, lower awe. 
And we learned that we each have a spark of Moshe within us. And that spark is connected to our capacity for dot, for focus and for inspiring emotions based on abstract concepts. So because I have a little mini Moshe inside of me, now it's easy for me to develop awe because Moshe has great awe. And uh, then chapters 42 and 43, we also learned about different levels of love. So you'll remember Ahava Rabbah, this great love, Avat Olam, this lower level of love that's connected to something in the world, right? Very simply put, if I love uh, the mountain and God is making the mountain, then if A equals B and B equals C, A must equal C. My love for the mountain means I also love God who is making the mountain. So I meditate on anything having to do with the physical world or even the spiritual worlds, and that inspires a love for God. We also learned about two levels of awe. I'm going through very quickly here just to catch us up. So don't be surprised if you weren't with us, if this uh, is, is just touching on points. There's Yura Boshet, which is a high level of awe where it's not about what God is doing. It's about the essence of who God is. And so God's making the world, but that's for God, that's nothing. The world doesn't exist compared to God. That's just one word creates the whole world. That's, that's not on God's resume. So if I'm in awe of God because of anything having to do with the physical or spiritual worlds, that's what God's doing. That's me being impressed with God's accomplishments. But that's not, that doesn't touch God's essence, what God is. Having a relationship with God and being in awe of God's essence, that's this higher level of your bushet. And then a lower level, as we described, Yuratata, where I'm in awe of God because of the world in any way. And uh, finally, 44, we learned about uh, some hybrid loves, which combine the higher and the lower, right? So we had the love of my soul I desire, the love of like a son, and so on. And then finally, the very last, uh, the very last chapter, chapter 45, We learned about uh, inspiring love based on the media of compassion. Not that we're using, not that we're inspiring compassion, but that when we have compassion on our own spark of godliness and realize how far it is from its source, that inspires uh, a flow from above that allows us to experience Ahava Rabbah, really the greatest flow, the highest uh, type of love that usually a tzaddik will uh, experience. So I know that's, uh, that's uh, you know, a tremendous number of topics. Um, but just in terms, of, in terms of the shape of where we are, we're now in a section that's learning about many, many types of love and meditations that will accomplish that love in order to elevate the Torah and mitzvahs that we're doing. Because that's really the point uh, of being here, being embodied, being a soul in a body, is to interact with the physical world and elevate it with our Jewish practices. So any questions just about kind of where we are, the scope? I don't want to get into any one of those particular topics. It would be, uh, that would take a few classes to, to unpack them. Wonderful. So now let's get going. We're actually starting an entire new section. Chapters 46 through 49 are uh, a new topic. Before we do that, though, I want, I want to tell you some uh, cool news. Uh, we put out our own book of the Tanya, our own formal edition of the Tanya, actually published by the original publisher. So we're, we're a, an official copy of the Wald Lake West Bloomfield Tanya. <laughs> but normally, when these thousands of editions of Tanya have been printed, one is placed in the library of uh, the last great master of this tradition, which is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. For various reasons, there was confusion, and all the Tanyas were shipped back to us, and not one of them went into the library. So uh, Rick was helping with this. He knows the details, the ins and outs, and thank you, Rick, for getting this past the, the gate, the finish line. I was in touch with uh, the gentleman who was helping us, Shmuel Jacobson. And he said, oh, if you want it in the library, fine, just send me a copy. We sent one back. It so happens that it arrived and he brought it in on a very special day, which was this past uh, Tuesday. And that was actually the yard site, the yard site, the day of passing of the Alter Rebbe himself. So that's the 24th of, uh, of uh, Tevis, right? The 24th of Tevis, Haftal of Tevis, is the yard site of this great master we're learning from. It's observed as an important day, and it's said that on a tzaddik's yard site, their soul is closest to the physical world, and all the work that they did is empowered and enlivened by their soul. So I was very inspired that, uh, thank you, Shmuel Jacobson. He actually brought one copy of our Temple Israel Tanya, 
to the Rebbe's library on Chafdalid uh, uh, Tevis, which is the, the, the Alta Rebbe's yard site. So I don't know how things can work out more perfectly. So when we start, we'll do just a few lines from our own Tanya, then I'll switch to uh, lessons in Tanya, which you're free to get. So this topic, which we'll learn for the next uh, uh, four chapters, is arriving at love of God through what we call a reciprocal love. Through a reciprocal love. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about it right at the beginning, so I won't get into the, uh, the uh, ins and outs of what the reciprocal love is. But a second piece is, if you're interested in elevating your davening and understanding how Kabbalah informs prayer, understanding what we can accomplish when we're saying, in particular, the Shema and the blessings around the Shema, these four chapters are uh, elementary in how Kabbalistic davening happens and how we understand it, how we get deeper and deeper into each section of the Shema and its blessings. <clears throat> so not only are we going to learn about uh, a profound meditation that can inspire uh, this, this very fiery love for absolutely anyone at any level, but also as we go through, we're going to learn insights and techniques for our prayers when we're at temple praying the Shema and the blessings around the Shema to actually bring Kabbalah and bring great spirituality into our own davening and the davening of our community. Does that make sense? So let's get going. Chapter 46. Perk Memva Vyesh Derek Yashar Lif Meish Shave Lefol Nefesh Vikarov Hadavar Meod Meod. Michael, can you tell me what page you're on in, in this? Oh, we are in Lessons in Tanya, page oh, no. 698 oh. at the top. In this one here, what page are this you on? This one we are on page 120, 129. 129, right here at the top. 129, right there at the top. It says, uh, Perik Memva, Yashar. And there is yet another. Yeah, go ahead. You ready? Okay. There is yet another straight way that is simple and straightforward that is equally applicable and suitable to every man. And this manner is very, very close in as much as the technique involved is uncomplicated. Okay, now I want us to stop. Because you could just go over it. You could, you could just read it in English and say, this matter is very, very close. And be, oh, okay, it's very, very close. In the Tanya that we've learned for how long now, has he ever said me'od, me'od before? We had, we had a whole section on, on just the word me'od, very, right? Okay, I know it's close, but saying it's very close, how can that be? We had a whole section on that, right? But now he's saying me'od, me'od, that's not even that's not even the text that that the quote's based on. Now he's adding his own mayot. So he's saying now this technique that we're teaching, unlike everything we've learned before, right? And think of all the types of love we learned about, like Ahava Rabba, Ahava Olam, love like a son. My soul, uh, my soul uh, desires you at night, right? Through compassion, the Alter Rebbe never used this language. It's not just close; it's super close. It's meod meod. So what he's telling us is this section is not just another love that's easy, it's qualitatively easy. There's something about this love that makes it even more accessible than anything we've learned before for absolutely any person. He says, equally applicable to every person. I remember, this is not somebody that, that was off, you know, in a, in a shtibble learning by himself. This is a person that had tens of thousands of adherents of Hasidim who were knocking on his door to, to report their troubles and their stresses and how could they learn more? How could they learn better? So he knew very well from counseling many, many people what the many different levels of, of people there are. And he was very well acquainted with our struggles. And so he's very confidently saying, it doesn't matter, Smolash, how bad a day you've had, how bad a year you've had, how off balance you feel, how toxic you might feel, whatever it might be. This is very, very close for absolutely every single level. There's a qualitative difference between this type of love, the next four chapters, and everything up to date. Uh, going more inside. The rare la year or hava ha tikua misoteret bilibo. So let's go. Uh, uh, oh, Gemma, if you want to read for us the English to arouse. Arousing. 
kindle the light of love that is implanted and concealed in his heart. So what will this do? If I do this meditation, no matter what level I'm at, I don't have to be a mystic, I don't have to be a sage, this will arouse and kindle a love that's concealed in my heart, guaranteed. And at what level? Liot mira, betokef ora, keesh bo ara, behitgalut li bo mocho. I'm back. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. oh. uh, that it may shine forth with its intense light like a flaming fire in the consciousness of the heart and mind. So this is not a love that's going to be concealed or subtle, just an intellectual level love that I'm using. It's a shortcut. This is an intense light. So it's, it's strong, like a flaming fire. It's not, not an ember. It's really a flaming fire. And it's in the consciousness, right? It's not something that, oh, it's subtle. You know, I spent my whole life covering it up and I know it's there in a subtle way and I'm using it, but this, it's really in my consciousness, not just in my mind, but also my heart. So every one of the sort of shortcuts that we've learned about or the, well, you know, even if it's just this kind of love, it still, it still works for you. This is not that situation. This is in your mind, in your heart, a flaming fire in your consciousness. It's real, it's passionate. And to what extent? I'm sorry, every time I go back from the view, I change the order you're in. So I don't remember what order you're in. So you'll have to kind of like help me out. Who is after Richard? Rick? Dan? Ultimately, enabling the person to surrender his soul to God together with his body and material possessions. All right. So here you have, you're getting to the text of the Shema, right? Meodo means uh, in some translations to surrender all my possessions to this this love of God that I'm that I'm inspiring with the Shema, but to surrender my soul to surrender to, to care about God more than even my own soul, including my body, my material possessions. This love is going to sweep up my consciousness to the point where it matters more than any of that. This being done with all his heart and all his soul and all his might with the boundless devotion of his soul's essence. As, as you hear, here's again the text of the, uh, the, text of the uh, Shema. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. We, we, we just kind of sometimes knock that off in our services, but really to have a love that includes my heart and my soul and all my possessions and even my my attachment to my own life force, that, that's, that's a, a tall order. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so who's after, uh, perhaps? Okay, uh, my clock was ringing. Uh, from the depth of the heart in absolute truth. Ah, so now in case you thought this was just, uh, uh, you know, do we really think we're accomplishing this? This is really from the bottom of my heart and in total truth, right? He's really doubling and tripling down that this is A, qualitatively different. It applies to everyone. B, easy, easy to achieve. It's very, very accessible to us. And C, it's real. It's my whole consciousness. It's from the bottom of my heart. It's passionate. It's, it's, a, it's a palpable love. And when And especially a most propitious time for a person to kindle this love in such manner is at a time of the recital of the Shema and its blessings, as will be explained later, on a particular connection of the Shema and its blessings to the arousal of this love. All right, so if, if you're joining us, if you have the experience of saying the Shema, whether in the morning or at bedtime or at services, and it's, okay, I'm here with my community, it's nice, I like the music, it's a, it's a good feeling, I'm glad I did it, I feel satisfied. If that's sometimes the extent of your experience of the Shema, I, I promise you at the end of these four chapters, it's going to be turned on its head and you'll find the Shema is perhaps the spiritual peak of your week. The Shema is something that allows you to go to the depth of your own soul. And the Shema is something that allows you to channel the wisdoms of Kabbalah into your own consciousness to 
create this love that uh, will elevate everything around you. Drum roll, please. Vehu, and this technique is kasher yasim elibo mashemar hakatuv kamayim apanim lapanim ken lev adam el hadam. And this technique for revealing this love is to take to heart the meaning of the verse as water mirrors the face to the face, so does the heart of man to man. So this is from uh, Proverbs. And he says to take to heart, to really get the depth of the meaning of the verse, as water mirrors the face to a face, so does the heart of a person to a person. And this is from Proverbs, which is said to be written by Shlomo, right? <clears throat> so what it means is, say you're looking into a, a still pool of water and you see your own face and you're smiling, what's the reflection gonna be doing? Smiling. Smiling, it's easy, right? If you're frowning, what's the reflection gonna be doing? Frowning, it's easy. And is there any delay? Is there any, does the reflection have to work to mirror what you're doing, right? Is there any effort involved whatsoever? <laughs> In fact, could it do anything else, right? It's just, that's how it is. When you see a face in water reflected, whatever the face is doing, the face in the water is doing the same thing. Now, if you wanna take some time and read the, the, the Rebbe, the last Rebbe of this tradition's note, he points out that that's not really what the meaning is in Proverbs. Proverbs does not say a face automatically reflects a face. Proverbs is, is a Musa. Pro, Proverbs is, sets out teaching us how to live a moral life and giving us moral instruction. So when this line is in Proverbs, the context is, this is what you should do. If someone loves you, it's appropriate, it's proper behavior for you to reflect that love and love them back, right? <clears throat> so Pshat, in terms of what Proverbs is getting out there, is not saying that this is human nature and automatic. It's saying, this is how you should behave, right? If someone loves you, you should love them back, no matter what, what reasons you have otherwise. The Alter Rebbe, as he often does, is taking this and going to a deeper meaning, going to a different level of the Torah and saying, no, it's not just moral instruction. It's actually human nature. It's automatic. It's, it's uh, reciprocal. That when someone else expresses love to me, there is an automatic reflection. And this may not be always conscious in my heart, right? I, I, may, I may be able to suppress this because, you know, you may be thinking in your mind, what about uh, unrequited love, right? We'll get to that. But somewhere in me, when someone expresses love, there is a reciprocal love that comes from me that starts to flow, right? And it's, and it's automatic. Let's go on a little more and then come back to that point. Paula, have you read yet? To unmute and go ahead. Is it working? Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. So indeed is also the heart of a man who is loyal in his affection for another person. Right oh, uh, let's do the bottom. Let's do the bottom of uh, 69. This means. Oh, sorry, I skipped. This means that as in the case of the likeness and features of the face which a man presents to the water, the identical face is reflected back to him from the water. All right. So here he's not saying that you should that you should uh, follow this advice. If someone loves you, love them back. He's saying. Anytime someone loves someone else, automatically there's a reciprocal flow from their heart and love starts to flow back. Page 700. And I think we're starting back at Cindy now, unless, uh, is there anyone that hasn't read yet? I, I, uh, my order got, got changed. Great, let's start with Cindy. Okay. So indeed is also the heart of a man who is loyal in his affection for another person. So he says, just like the face is reflected in the water, when any one of us expresses love to any other one of us, the same reflection happens in their heart. They don't have to work at it. They don't have to uh, conjure it up. 
something happens spiritually where their heart creates a flow of love that is as automatic as my face smiling back in the water. This love which he has for the other awakens a loving response for him in the heart of his friend also, so that they can come to love each other loyally. Makes sense. And one more, Bifrat Especially when he sees his friend's love for him freely revealed. So notice he's pointing out, it's even more powerful when I see the love revealed. When the person is smiling at me and saying, I love you and giving me a gift and appreciating me, it's even more powerful. It's especially so when I see it revealed. But what does that mean that the Alter Rebbe pointed out that it's especially so when it's revealed? It means that it also applies when it's not revealed. Right? It, it may be more subtle, but it also applies when it's someone who is 100 miles away, someone who I, I can't see their face, and I may not even know that it's happening. But there's a spiritual connection we all have where when one person expresses love to another person, even if they're not aware, there is something that happens, a flow that happens in their heart that is automatic that begins. <clears throat> so you might ask, what about unrequited love? Because that's a common thing. We're not talking here about attraction, right? Often when we say unrequited love, we really mean, you know, a young person loves another person, the other person doesn't love them back. But what does it mean? It means I don't find you appropriate, attractive enough to be, you know, an intimate partner. And so I don't, I don't have that kind of amorous love for you. But ask yourself this, any young person, when they find out that someone has a crush on them, so to speak, does nothing happen in their heart? Nothing at all. There's not like, oh, how I can't, you know, even if, even if the feeling is like, oh, that's not the right person for me. Still, there's a feeling that flows. Now, we have free will, and we can't suppress our instincts. We can block a love that's flowing, but it's not that there's no reaction in that young person who is having unrequited love. It's that something happens in their heart. It's this flow of reflective love, but then there's not attraction. It's not appropriate, whatever it might be. They block it, and maybe they feel kind of like embarrassment or whatever, but the elder Rebbe is saying, this is human nature, that if someone is loving me, then my heart will be, will create a flow of love. Now I'm curious, I, I brought this up with my family. I was roundly voted down and all my children felt like this, this is not real. This is, this is uh, nonsense. So I'm curious, what do you guys think? Uh, uh, and let me try and check on Facebook online. If you're following on my Facebook page, feel free to leave comments or questions. Do you guys think this is something you relate to that if someone loves you, boom, you have some kind of beginning of love flowing in your heart or no? Mostly, mostly, not always. Mostly, not always, mostly. So what's, what's the not always? Not always is because of why? Um, some people you may not trust. I have a re long-term relationship with somebody in my family and I cannot always be sure that she means what she says or that she will do it. So because she's been in my family and has been for a long, long time, I have this feeling for her and I would like it to be more, but I can't believe it's going to be more. Right, exactly. So, so Paula, whatever the painful situation, I'm sorry to hear it. Sometimes someone may love us and we have a reciprocal flow of love, but then I also have an awareness, oh, maybe things are not always on the level. Maybe there's, there's painful things that will come because they have in the past and I blocked that love. I have free will to block love that's flowing, but still I have affection for the person in my family initially, right? It's just that I'm choosing because of perhaps very good reasons to protect myself and keep it, keep it from going further. Yeah. Yeah. Noreen. It's like when you smile at somebody and they smile back. I mean, it, you know, maybe that's on a superficial level, but people respond to other people who like them. It's, I think that's very normal. Yeah, I think we see it. We see it in casual interactions every day. When I smile at someone, a stranger, I'm not expressing necessarily profound love from the bottom of my heart. I'm expressing an appropriate social, uh, call it affection. You know, I'm friendly <laughs> to you, and they're friendly back. So there's love in my heart. It's reflected by love in their heart. And even though it's superficial, um, it's a real love. It's a subtle level of love, and we see it and we reflect it back for sure. It's a connection. Yeah. I also think that um, 
maybe we're confusing trust with love. Um, you can love a person, but set a boundary so they don't intrude on you. But you, I, ha I have a brother-in-law who I have that relationship with. You know, I'm there for him, I do for him. But sometimes when he asks, I have to say no. Yeah, and I'll remind everybody, these are being posted. So as we talk about personal situations, keep in okay. mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll never hear it. <laughs> there you go. So absolutely, we're, we're not talking about trust. The Alter Rebbe is not saying you, you will notice now be... all, all these. Yes, Dan? You notice all these relationships so far are within family, but not person to person. So, okay. So I think within family, we've, we've, we've established, we're not talking about trust uh, or, or even long-term friendships or, you know, an old. So if there's been problems in the relationship, I may decide even though I feel love for a person, I'm going to use my gvura, my strength to say, okay, but the love only goes so far. I'm, I'm not going to put myself at risk of whatever, right? And so loving someone doesn't mean trusting someone. All it means is my right. flow of chesed, my flow of chesed is uh, ignited and is flowing. She took your order, you're doing good, honey. Yeah, they do. There. Right, and as, as we said, chesed, I said many times, chesed does not consider the receiver chesed just flows once the love is flowing i may say wait this person may not be a safe person for me to actively express the love and okay but the love still was flowing but let me ask this about some random stranger if there's some person you know if uh you know some rabbi at central synagogue in new york and they they're watching our services and they just they 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 love what i do and they have so much respect for what i do and they're having a feeling for me but they haven't let me know, they haven't expressed, I have no idea. Is it possible that them having love for me as a co-clergy person will create affection in my heart even though I don't know about it? Is it possible we're connected in that way? Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're all like mind. I'm not so I sure think. I agree with that. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Now we got, Rick, okay. tell me about it. Well, how would you, I mean, how would, how would your heart know that this person expressed love to you? There is, there's no way to know that. I have an online. Thank you, Lisa. Genuine kindness is affection, inspires most to feel something. So Lisa, thank you. Absolutely. But that's the question. I don't consciously know that this person miles away or hundreds of miles away right. has any feeling towards me. So how would I... How would anything happen in my heart? Cindy, you got an answer for that? No, I don't have an answer. I have a comment. <laughs> Two comments. Um, the first one reminds me of something I heard long ago from a friend who always said, a heart knows a heart. Like you can, you intuit what is coming towards you. You kind of have that sense and that feeling of, of what's happening. A heart knows a heart. The second is when you think about prayer, Think about, for example, the Mishaberach, and you can do, in essence, long distance healing without the other person's awareness that you're praying for them. It may well have an effect. You don't know that. So, therefore, why wouldn't, if someone has really enjoys what you're doing or has an affection towards you from a long distance? You may still have an effect. You may not recognize it. You may not know where it's coming from, but there might be some internal response to it that's on a subconscious level that you receive. Who's to say it isn't? Right. So, Rick, that's uh, thank you, Cindy. That's precisely how I'd address uh, you know, the doubter expression, which all of us probably feel like, really? Somebody hundreds of miles away loves me? I don't know. Like, good for them, but how does it affect me? That's my conscious take on reality. Uh, but if you look at what Cindy said, if I pray for someone who doesn't know, and my wife is very big on these studies, they've done studies where people didn't know they're being prayed right. for and still right. healed beyond placebo effect based on being prayed for by people uh, that, that, was, that they weren't aware of, right? So we've seen in science that you can affect healing when someone doesn't know it. Um, I'll point out there's lots of stuff going on with our hearts that is not conscious to us, right? We learned that hearts attune to each other. Two people that are within eight feet of each other their hearts and their heart rates will attune to each other. And I'm not, I'm not, 
I don't know what their heart rate is. I'm not aware of that. There's stuff happening right. in the emotional realm. That's just, you know, that's, that's the emotional world. That's, that's our emotional body. Not everyone is super sensitive to that. Some people might be. So the other also, thing, yeah, the sorry, other sorry. thing, add to that, even if someone is that far away, even if someone's on the other side of the planet, we are connected at some level. Our souls are all one. We're connected at some level so that every time love is expressed towards me and someone thinks of me and feels love, I may not be aware of it at first, but that is automatic. That is human nature. There is something in me, maybe subconscious, that starts to flow and that reflects that love. And it's does, the, <laughs> does the alter rabbi ever express the opposite of hate or bad thoughts going from one heart to the other? So he doesn't say it, but it's understood as well. If I'm, if I'm out there, uh, if, I, if I have animosity towards somebody and I'm trying to establish a relationship or do something, that's going to be a problem because also their heart senses my animosity and it creates mm -hmm. a reciprocal flow in them of animosity. So mm -hmm. the, the inverse is true. Um, and we want to be careful of that, uh, you know, lots of examples of that. For instance, when Judah approached Joseph, uh, Judah said, you know, he, he came closer. It's not just that he physically came closer. It's that Judah recognized that he saw this idol worshiper. He recognized that he still disliked his brother, Joseph, and there was trouble, even if he didn't recognize him. And he knew that he had to influence him. So he inspired love in his heart and brought himself emotionally closer to Joseph in order to influence him. So that's a recognition that when you're having negative feelings, that also will affect the other person's heart. And we want to be mindful of that. <clears throat> but he doesn't go into it here because here we're talking about creating a flow of love. Cantor, yes. I, I think there's also um, energy that's involved in that. You know, the molecules of energy that everything is one flows from one heart to another through energy. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, you remind me, and this is a bit of a tangent, but we, we really misunderstand even in the physical, for instance, how energy flows through, uh, through wires. Mm -hmm. you know, I have uh, all these wires here. Let me find one for you. Maybe I can. So we have these wires here. We think electrons are flowing through this wire, getting to a light bulb and then lighting it up and then going around back to the source. In fact, what's happening is they're setting up magnetic and electro electric fields, mm -hmm. and the power is actually going through the fields, not through the wires. I don't want to get into it, right? But if you understand electricity, it's not at all like power going through a straw. It's actually power being projected through these fields. Um, and it doesn't matter if this wire could be a thousand miles long that way and back. It's the, the energy goes at the speed of light directly through these fields, right? So we sometimes misunderstand even the physical, how much more so the emotional and how any one of us, how the energy from one of us impacts and travels to the energy of any other one of us. So there's a whole world in there. And when you get into the spiritual side of things, it's not so surprising that someone who loves me from a hundred miles away that I don't know about creates the flow of love in me. And likewise, if I can create a flow of love for everyone around me, that brings love up in them towards myself. Very good. Uh, we'll do a little more and then we'll just finish with some meditation at the end. Oh, thank you, Lisa. 100% agree about energy. As with anything, you must be open to receive. That's from our Facebook page. zehu teva hanahug bimidat koladam af im shnehem shavim bimala. Are we at Noreen, maybe? No, Dan, I think. Oh, Dan, think, go ahead. I think it's me, is it? Go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Such is the common nature and the character of every man, even when they are equal in status. Right, so that's, that's, that's true if it's me and a colleague. Me and another cantor says, oh, look at what Smolash is doing. He's, I'm so impressed. I love that guy, right? Okay, of course, I'll love, I'll love my colleague back. How nice, right? But what if it's not people that are equal in status? What if it's not people equal in status? What if it's, in fact, the most disparate statuses you can imagine in society? Right? Imagine how much love would be reflected back. And now we're starting what's called a mashal, right? This is the way into this meditation. We're starting a mashal, a metaphor, a story, you might say, 
where we're taking this quality that we know a natural love is inspired in me, maybe subtle. And we're saying, what if it was not just equals? What if it was a higher and a lower person, so to speak, and the highest person and the lowest person? How much more so is this the case if a great and mighty king who rules over many lands displays his great and intense love for a commoner who is despised and lowly among men, a disgraceful creature cast on the downhill? All right, so there now he starts a story. Let, let me uh, let me sum up the story, and and, and we'll uh, probably get through it next week. So imagine we're not two equals in the situation. Imagine I'm a lowly person, and you know I know all people are equal, you know, and I respect all people. But I know in society, you know, if I wind up, God forbid, homeless, God forbid, with no possessions, God forbid, with no friends, let's call that a lowly person, right? Imagine a person is. No home, no possessions, no friends, living literally on a pile of garbage, on, on, a, on a dung heap, he says. That's the only place they could find was just, you know, dig out a hole in a pile of garbage to shelter myself. And that's my life. <clears throat> and I'm despised and lowly among everyone. People walk by me and kids look at me with pity. And, and my, that's just my whole life is that I'm at that station in society. And imagine that not just a regular person, not just a wise or wealthy person, but the actual king of the whole kingdom. So this, this figure that I've never seen is so far away, is in the kingdom, has power over everyone, is considered the wisest of all people, is the most powerful of all people. Imagine if that person came and, and came out of their palace, didn't even summon me the way you normally would for any minister, but actually came out of his palace with his whole retinue, like there's parades and there's soldiers and there's trumpets, and the king marched up to my little spot on my dung heap, and the king himself, not a messenger, came and reached out and lifted me up. And then what did the king do? Didn't just kind of clean me up and set me up with a life or whatever. Actually brought me into his carriage, back to his, his home. And not just to his home, but through chamber after chamber until we got to a door that no, no servant, no minister could ever enter. The, the most private chamber of this king. And we went in there together and I was dressed in good robes and clean and fed. And the king sat down and listened to everything as I poured my heart out and he poured his heart out. And we hugged and we embraced and became closest to friends. <clears throat> that is the most extreme example, perhaps, of two disparate people in society that the Alter Rebbe could find. And he's saying, imagine if the king expressed that much love to me and I was this lowly station in society. Imagine how my heart would be overflowing with gratitude that I was no longer hungry, no longer cold, no longer friendless. The whole world now looked to me and wondered what's so special about me. Now I'm, you know, I have a place in society. I'm in the king's inner chamber and over a king. We're friends forever, right? We're BFFs. Imagine how much love would reciprocally flow from my heart. Are you guys with me? You're with me on this uh, muscle? <clears throat> and then he says, that's nothing compared to the difference between us and God and what happened with us and God. Right? If you think that is tremendous love and would be automatic, wait till you see if we go through every detail of this story and how it applies to our relationship with God, how God took us out of Mitzrayim, the lowest place on the earth, and brought us right to Sinai and gave us the Torah and embraced us with hugs and kisses in what's like almost a marriage ceremony. And that's, that's the, the essence of the meditation that will apply to absolutely everyone for reasons we'll get into. Um, let's do just a few more minutes, and then we'll uh, finish with a meditation. Viored ela mim kom kvodo im kol sarav yachtav. Yet he? Yet he, the king, comes down to him from the place of his glory together with all his retinue. Umekimo, umrimo, meashpato, umachniso lehechalo, hechal hamelech, cheder lifnim mecheder, makom shein kol eved. I think Paula now, or maybe oh. Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen, why don't you go then, Paula? Okay, and raises him and exalts him from his dunghill and brings him into the palace, the royal palace. 
and within the palace itself, he leads him to the innermost chamber, a place such as no servant nor Lord ever enters. So imagine if I'm this, this person who was just this morning, woke up on, on a garbage pile with no friends, no food, no, no hope. And now here I am, the king himself came and brought me into the palace to a place where no one else has ever been. <laughs> imagine how you feel, right? We'll go ahead, uh, Paula. How much more so will there be aroused of itself a doubled and redoubled love in the heart of his most common and humble individual for the person of the king with a true attachment of spirit from heart and soul, from the infinite depths of his heart. Okay, and when we, I'll do the bottom of 701. And there shares with him the closest companionship, embraces and kisses, uh, an attachment of spirit to spirit with her whole heart and soul. If that's the case, how much more so will that uh, reflective love happen in this commoner to a king? The commoner will just, their heart will be, flowing and pouring with love. And Cindy, won't you finish for us? Top of 703. How much more so? Oh, no, sorry even in this heart will be like the heart of stone and not easily roused to tender feelings of love for another. In such a situation, it will surely melt and become like water and his soul will pour itself out like water with soulful longing for the love of the king. So imagine, even if this person were hardened by life and stoic and just unfeeling, they're just, you know, I'm just gonna get through the day and if I have to steal or, you know, no one cares about me, I don't care about them years and years and years of covering up their heart perhaps nevertheless as he says their heart will uh the heart will melt and water will pour out with a soulful longing and love for the king they i mean they'd have no choice right just this the combination of the human nature that a love reflects a heart reflects a heart combined with that he was the lowest station in society and the king came and brought him to the very, very inner chambers and expressed his whole feeling for him, he'd have no choice. His heart would just melt and flow with love. And that's the essence of this meditation. And that's why it can affect every one of us. Because in fact, the lower my station is in this story, the more uh, hopeless my situation is, the, the more love I'm even gonna feel for the king who came to me, right? So it doesn't matter if I if I don't have learning. It doesn't matter if I've acted out and I'm emotionally unstable. It doesn't matter if I if I if I uh, I've just been a mean person. I'm ashamed of myself. The lower that I find myself, the more love will be inspired by this meditation, and that's why it applies specifically to every single level and is very very close. Yes, Noreen. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> it went from the time. <laughs> it took forty years, right? I mean, I uh, agree with what you're saying, but the example from Mitzrayim for the love of God, it just didn't happen that way. Well, didn't I mean, we'll look at it, but it didn't take 40 years to get from Egypt to Sinai, right? No, three months. Yeah, you're talking about you're talking about uh, getting to Israel, but yeah. but we're talking uh, the about the whole experience of of the relationship with God. It had its ups and downs. <laughs> right. So <laughs> we're we're going from God coming to Mitzrayim to us getting the tour at Sinai. Now, what happens after the marriage? That's not part of the meditation, right? So that's life. So I get, I get the ups and downs. But we're just the meditation is just if we're stopping at Sinai, we got the Torah. We're all, we're all at the level of a tzaddik, and we all love God, and, and that's that's what we're using. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring the the, the golden calf or the quail into this meditation necessarily. Good idea. So let, let's finish with uh, uh, our system of meditation. We're going to quickly thanks, Suellen. We're going to quickly. Uh, uh, clear our minds with a system of breathing and feel free to join us on Facebook as well. Or if you're watching in the future, we'll clear our mind with a system of breathing. 
And then we'll introduce what's called a wisdom gateway. And we'll introduce this divine concept into the wisdom gateway. Those are the three components of meditation in Judaism. We clear the mind with a simple technique. It doesn't have to stay empty. In fact, it shouldn't. We open up what we call a gateway for Chochmah, for wisdom. And then we quickly reintroduce a divine concept that fills the mind with all the details of that concept until the mind, rather than being completely empty, is completely full. So if you want to join me, get into a comfortable position, seated or any other position. And just let your breathing slow down and deepen. Take stock of your body. Shoulders are a little held, perhaps let them drop. Eyeballs are not smooth, let them smooth out. And the whole forehead and face can be smooth and relaxed. Breath still flowing in and out naturally and deeply. Feel the weight of your body on the seat beneath you and your feet on the floor. And we're gonna open up our breathing to have four counts for each of the four stages of breathing. So four counts to breathe in, four counts to keep the breath in, four counts again to breathe out, and the final four counts to leave the breath empty out. So with me breathing in, two, three, four, stay there, two, three, you're doing great. Now breathe out, two, three, Four, nice and empty. Two, three. That's one cycle. Start again. In, two, three, four. Keep the breath in. Two, three, four. Releasing it out. Two, three, four. And keeping yourself empty. Two, three. Starting again. Keep going on your own in that cycle. You can bring in your belly so that your belly is now expanded as you hold the breath in. And as you're breathing out, the belly pulls up in towards your diaphragm. As you continue this breathing cycle, if you're uh, watching this not in real time with us, feel free to pause your device and take a few minutes to let this four stage breathing kind of settle in and feel natural. Now we're gonna open up what's called a wisdom gateway. It is the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. So there's sort of an empty space between the end of my in-breath and the beginning of my out-breath. And I will project onto that my wisdom gateway. However you see it visually, maybe with sound, make sure you're in the picture and let that wisdom gateway open as you continue through this breathing cycle. A sort of a spiritual uh, intention of staying in that wisdom gateway as you go through the rest of the breathing cycle. Again, I encourage you to pause your video for perhaps a minute or two as you establish this wisdom gateway. If you're with us, we'll now introduce the divine concept we'll be learning about in the next four chapters. And as water reflects a face, so does a heart reflect a heart. As water reflects a face, so does a heart reflect a heart. And just think in whatever way you'd like of how much God loves each of us, how much trust God puts in us, that our heart is just naturally, automatically responding with love towards God. Let that divine concept fill your mind, your wisdom gateway with every detail that comes to you. We were doing a proper class on heat bonanut. We might stay here for 15, 20 minutes, but let it fill your mind even deeper. Heat bonanut in meditation. If, if your mind is distracted and goes elsewhere, just no need to empty anything. Just let the concept fill that 
that field in your mind, that space in your mind. So it flows and fills your mind up like a cup filled with wine. And notice any emotions have been inspired, any even subtle flow of love meditating on this divine concept in the altar rhythm. Again, feel free to make this a 10, 15, 20 minute sit. But if you're here, our class is done. So wiggle your fingers and toes and welcome back. <laughs> welcome, Gemma. I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, our first class. You started at a great time, uh, starting a new section of the Tanya. So uh, you can hang on. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to sign up on Facebook. Thanks to all the people. Hi, Julie. Hi, Judy. Hi, uh, Abba Mori. My dad's watching on Facebook. So welcome to everyone that's been on Facebook. We're signing off and uh, hope you have a wonderful uh, American New Year and, and we'll see you next class.